title of this approach or this this uh, demonstration is going to be chasing a new strat trap opportunity using gverse geomodeling we'll talk about pesky questions and slick tips for play delineation and i want to comment on john french here who worked with me on this john has been a tremendous mentor over the many years that i've interacted with him back when it was just smart section and as it has evolved this tool has become incredibly powerful and it, it has really made me a believer in the opportunities that it that it can generate. So let's talk about basin fill controls. First and foremost, the, the interaction between sediment supply and sea level and subsidence or uplift is fundamental to how a basin fills. If we have sea level or used to see happening, if sea level rises, we create space that sediment can be deposited within. If sea level falls, we create a broad erosional surface that can remove a great deal of sediment. If tectonics is subsiding, we create a hole or a basin into which we can fill our sediment. If, if, if our tectonics instead of subsiding is rising, we create broad areas of exposure and erosion. Sediment supply, of course, is what's all about filling the hole and the and increasing sediment supply can create perturbation during a uniform subsidence and decreasing sediment supply can cause transgression during the form of subsidence. But today we're gonna to focus on a big through going erosional surface, partly due to te tectonic uplift and subaerial erosion, erosion, erosion and, um, and also due to sea level rise grinding across that tectonic high. So here's our example of lowering sea level, perhaps a highland rising back in this direction Subaerial exposure across a broad area, incision of valleys, and the planation of large areas with sediment being pumped offshore. During the subsequent transgression, this can be ground off smooth and flat. If we have a look at that transgressive succession, in your extreme case, we can actually create large sea cliffs as this, as this short uh, wave cut platform is cut during transgression. We undercut the cliff, the cliff falls in, and this rate of of, of transgression can be in excess of a meter per year as these cliffs fall into the ocean and are ground in a broad flat plain. It's probably some of what happened in the early Pennsylvanian of East Central Oklahoma, which is where we're gonna be looking at rocks. So let's look at East Central Oklahoma. The area we're gonna be talking about is on the northwestern side of the Arcoma Basin in this part of Oklahoma. It sits just to the east of the Anadarko Basin. So this was a paleo high which sat exposed during a large period of time of the formation of the Anadarko and Arcoma Basin during the um, mid, mid to early Pennsylvanian this area was heavily uplifted and eroded across. We have a look at that same area now this is from the very lowermost Pennsylvanian these Pennsylvanian rocks were deposited across a broad area the carbonate shelf here sands being pumped out during the low stand and then the subsequent uplift across the Cherokee platform and along parts of the Nemaha fault zone, the Seminole Arch, resulted in erosion of the lowermost Pennsylvania across a broad area in eastern Oklahoma, as well as going back into the deeper part of the Anadarko Basin. These aerially extensive erosion surfaces um, completely removed huge thicknesses of sediment, certainly even within a little two, two township area that we're going to be looking at in this general area. Uh, we're talking about on the order of just within two townships, over 600 feet of, of uh, low stand and transgressive erosion. So these aggressive erosional events occurred all along these surfaces. We'll start out first looking at the edge of the Anadarko Basin, and then we'll move on to the target of what we're going to be talking about today. The Anadarko Basin edge, we see tremendous thicknesses. Of, of sediment coming up and being truncated underneath the Atokan unconformity, which records the collision in part between, uh, between North America and the African continent. If we look, we can also see fault movement along the face of these. These faults have offsets and created additional accommodation for sediment to be, to, to be deposited and preserved. Other areas, it's likely that that sediment was deposited, but we didn't have enough subsidence to protect it from the erosion, essentially the lawnmower coming through, cutting off the high blades of grass during transgression and erosion. If you have fault movement occurring during deposition or just after deposition and prior to the uh, transgressive erosional surface coming through, this is an example from the almond formation in 
um, in southwestern Wyoming, but it applies in Oklahoma equally as well. The bulldozer grinds across. If, if you've had enough tectonic subsidence before that happens along these faults, we can preserve different pieces of sediment in different ways. We see much the same in east central Oklahoma. So here's a G versus Q model showing multiple horizons. We can see that there was an active uplift. We flattened here on the Atokan unconformity. There's a major flooding surface that comes across the top of it. The, the units above are reasonably conformable, although we can see there's a little more accommodation going into the thickening here, more accommodation of sediment going into the Arcoma Basin. Coming up onto the Cherokee Arch, we see much less accommodation. But down below, we can see the Paleo Cherokee Arch area growing and the truncation of a very large thickness of Pennsylvania sediment and indeed even Mississippian age sediment being truncated underneath this unconformity. So we're going to be talking about how we use geoverse geomodeling to understand the nature and character of these transgressive or, tra or transgressive or low stand erosional events and how that truncation ends up. So let's focus in a little bit closer now. We're going to be working in an area that's only two townships in size, and we can see here the, the regional pinch out of a major unit sitting right in here as it's being pinched out. Its upper layer or its upper edge is here, that's that pink color, and its lower boundary where it's truncated completely is this darker crimson color on the outside. And then this is the structure across the surface of it. Here you can see the structure um, as it is today. This area would have been higher. Here we, we've truncated now, hung it off of the unconformity itself, and we can see that everything would have been coming up and pinching out underneath this through going unconformity with then fairly conformable units sitting above. So now we're going to go ahead and move on to our, our demonstration. And the objective today is to talk about how we would delineate subcrop relationships in this lower Pennsylvania reservoir. We're going to talk about how we might determine um, the ways in which we would approach determining conformity controls for the geosurface modeling. If you don't apply those, uh, those careful conformance and inconformity controls, it can make a mess out of your projected uh, positions of individual surfaces. We'll talk for a while about those sneaky surfaces unconformities. Unconformities live unto themselves and in geomodeling have to be dealt with as part of, of unconformity networking. We'll then do a number of arbitrary lines. One of the things I love about this, this geomodeling software is that it allows me to do arbitrary lines across my database. Um, I've got over a thousand wells that have been picked through here, but it allows me to go in between wells and see what the relationships look like. Tremendous power in that. Then we'll bring it all together and talk about generating prospect. And we'll go to 3D to document the nature of the trap and also to show how you can generate images that are very beneficial for showing someone who might not otherwise visualize in 3D. So now we'll move on to the demonstration and we'll let John talk a little bit about the setup of the system and where we go from here. Okay, Lee, <coughs> I'm gonna bring up geomodeling here. Let's see, there we go, here comes geomodeling. Perfect, go. perfect, I'm not gonna, I'm going to try not to talk too much because uh, I don't want you to be short shrifted by having to listen to me. You have to listen to the good doctor talk geology, but I want to give you a little bit of an idea of the setup of this particular project. So here we are in Geoverse Geomodeling main map view. I'm in the tools menu and I just wanted to show you briefly uh, the stratigraphic setup. So I'm going to go to Strat Column Manager and show you that we have a relatively a small strat column, which is always a good thing when you're doing geomodeling. You don't want to have 500 surfaces in your strat column. Uh, we have a uh, probably what 12 surfaces here. Uh, absolutely critical to get these in the correct strat order. So I just want to point that out. Very, very important in terms of geoverse geomodeling. So there's our strat column we're dealing with. I'll go ahead and close that. And since I didn't do anything, I'll cancel the requests to update all views. Uh, a few sources as well, primarily Lee's source here, LFK, that's what we're gonna be dealing with. And the only other thing I wanna show you, no, I don't wanna update, stop it. Uh, the only other thing I wanted to show you was the edit interpretation options menu. 
where we are actually loading all the wells in our GVerse Geo Modeling interpretation that are in the project or AOI, because we only have at most a few thousand wells here that we're dealing with, so not a problem. Again, you might want to use a filter if you have 500,000 wells in your project and you only have, say, 8,000 that have your picks and that's all you really want to work with. But in this case, the project's small enough that we can load all the wells, okay? So that's our setup. And uh, without further ado, I will let Lee take it from here and talk geology. All right, John, thank you very much. So this map shows a map, a structure map on the top of the Mississippian within these three or these two townships that we're sitting, that are sitting right in here. And I've run a cross section uh, integrating wells, one or two per every section running across from Northwest to Southeast across these, um, across these services. Um, so the question here is, and what I've done is I've chosen a view um, that allows us to, uh, I've chosen a view that allows us to, to be able to, to work with the uh, cross section and see just the picks that I've made. In this case, it's straight, it's the, and the view in this case, we'll make sure you can see it. I've gone edge to edge for my wells. I've clicked on view, gone edge to, so the stratigraphic section, I've gone edge to edge for my wells or for the logs. I've gone with a straight line mode and no surface projection. So these are straight up hard picks that I've made as I've gone through and done the correlations. So if we zoom in on this, you can, and what I've done is I've picked to where I didn't think I could pick any further. So I've got above my big regional, um, my big regional a token on conformity. I have through going flat line surfaces above. I have my big regional, a token on conformity. And I can see that I have surfaces cruising along pretty easy picks. This is particularly distinctive coming across here coming up here, coming up to there, and then gone. But I've got great picks underneath it that allow me to see it continue on up. So now I'm going to ask Geoverse Geomodeling to project where these picks should go, and that will then allow me to start mapping in 3D. So this is excellent. We've got a nice top here that comes up as truncated, just almost made it, it's truncated sitting in here. We don't see it ever again going west on the, on the section. So all of that makes pretty good sense. And if we back off now, and backing off, I'm just going to look at the full width of my section right here. What I can see is that here's my through going unconformity. Everything's reasonably conformable above. Down below, I have my Mississippian age rocks. And for those of you who work in this part of the world, clearly this off scale uh, gamma ray right in here is the Woodford Formation. If we flatten on the Woodford, I could flatten on one of the other Mississippian horizons equally well. What we can see happen is now a beautiful example of that unconformity gradually carving its way down across the section. And this distance right in here is in excess of 600 feet that the unconformity carves away. And it continues carving down into the Mississippian just a little further west onto the Cherokee Arch. You can also see an area here where there was a small fault that dropped down. And that down drop fault, I just flattened here with my space bar on the overlying Pennsylvania marker, that fault down dropped and preserved a piece of all of this sediment, but none of this is preserved sitting above it. So how do we go about the process of projecting those picks? And what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna shift over to um, another cross section which in this case, we're going to take out all of the, take out all of the logs. And so we're gonna to go to this section here and that section, um, turn it on, um, is, uh, well, should be able to, uh, should allow us to see, uh, should allow us to see exactly what's going on as the system projects these amazing surfaces across. Oops, wait a minute, John, what's going on here? Oh dear. Should we stop the demonstration, John, or is there something I'm missing? Maybe well, you, it's- You sure made a mess of that one, didn't you? Uh, yeah, I sure did. <laughs> My goodness. Everything's working beautifully up to this point, and then all of a sudden this pick runs right through my unconformity, and all of this stuff is just going crazy. What's going on? 
Well, what's going on, of course, is the system is projecting what it thinks should be where the top would be based on its structural position. We already know that there are structures rolling through here, high and low, so the projections are all messed up. So how do we go through and address correcting those? We've got a thousand wells worth of data here. We've been able to show that they, they're reasonably conformable, sensible surfaces. So now what do we do to sort it all out? Well, the first thing we can do is go up here to our geosurface model properties. And we're gonna open up that. When geosurface modeling properties opens up, what we see is that, that we have the option, one, to turn surfaces on or off. In this case, I don't have surface number four turned on. Maybe I'm chasing after an exploration opportunity in it that you're not gonna to get to see. Sorry about that. Uh, but what we can do is then say, well, right now, all of these surfaces that I've got, here's my surfaces here, the surface constraints show that everything's just stacked one on top of another. In fact, though, we know that we have a big unconformity sitting here that's not going to be behaving itself. We know that we have another little unconformity. This dark green is an unconformity that is disconformable, which marks the surface between the overlying Pennsylvanian and the underlying Mississippian succession. If we are to, if we, if we sit down and start thinking about what's conformable to what, we know that these upper pin units are conformable. I'm going to make the, the first, or the, make this pin one more or less parallel with pin two. Now, as I go across it, you can see that we go from a thick interval here to a thin interval there with the hard points that I pick. It's not going to unify that. It's going to be, it will accurately reflect the thicknesses I picked here but it's going to say they are roughly conformable. So I'm gonna take pin two and place it on top of pin one. Then, um, then I'm going to go through and look at my, my pin three, which is the big through going and token on conformity. I don't want that to be the case. But down here, the Mississippi and number two in here is a through going surface that I can see going all the way across my section. So I'm going to make it a critical uh, surface that's going to determine parallelism. The MIS-3 is, is, is parallel with the MIS-2. The, the pre-MIS stuff is going to be parallel with it. Um, and then we still have to deal now with our Pennsylvanian stuff. If we have a look at our Mississippian, um, our, our first Mississippian reflector or marker, I almost want to make it seismic, we end up with it pinching out over here locally. So it can't be the one I'm depending on, but it's, but, um, but I can make it dependent on and parallel to, okay. And then, so the pin seven um, is an unconformity, which is, which is roughly parallel with the uh, MIS-3. And so I'm gonna make it here. The pin six is parallel with the pin seven. And the pin five is parallel with the pin six. So this should result in a much more conformable and well-behaved system. So we're going to turn on the conformance tool and see what happens. So now we have, you can see we have a series of surfaces coming through that are behaving conformably. I still don't have a good conformance sitting on this one. And I think I probably need to change the relationship between minus one and minus two. Everybody notice what Lee's doing is he's interpreting that the deeper surfaces in this case are more through going, right? The shallower surfaces get truncated against that pen three unconformity. So he's using those deeper surfaces to constrain the shallower surfaces, which will essentially push them through the unconformity appropriately. And eventually he's going to 
invoke some additional geomodeling tools to, uh, there we go, to get the geology uh, really nailed in terms of the truncations. Got it now, Lee, you like it? Indeed, much better. Yep. But wait a minute, it's still blasting through the unconformity. Yeah, but... what's up with that? surfaces are now conforming to one another in what looks like a geologically sensible fashion. I've made a series of conformable Mississippian surfaces make sense. I've taken an unconformable or slightly disconformable surface here, which is the Mississippi and Pennsylvania unconformity running across, and you can see it cutting down toward it. Locally, it cuts down and even through this marker, but for the most part, it is generally conformable with the underlying surfaces. Then we have the overlying Pennsylvanian surfaces and their relative thicknesses determining what's going on. We've got our big main unconformity, the token unconformity, and the overlying, overlying Pennsylvanian surfaces that make sense, but that doesn't make sense at all. So now what we have to do is to go in and establish unconformity clipping, which is this tool sitting in here. When we turn on that unconformity clipping and it is following the uh, following the opportunity that we have here, where we have our pin one, pin two are parallel with one another, the unconformity is its own beast, and we know it, and it's listed as an unconformity. And then we have all of these surfaces sitting in their relative relationships. We can now turn on the unconformity clipping tool and turn it and, and update the model. And everything's pretty good, but wait a minute, what's going on here? John, doggone it, I thought that was supposed to clip off. What is it that we're missing? Oh, wait a minute. This, remember I mentioned, is also an unconformity. Unconformities get to do their own thing. They don't have to pay attention to all the other stuff because they're used to cutting right straight through stuff. In this case, though, we know we have a master unconformity the pin three, the token unconformity. This one is supposed to be clipped right about there. So now we go up to our last uh, succession. And one of the things we can see, if, if we look at our, our geosurface modeling, we look at, we've looked at our surface constraints and arranged them in, in all proper order. But now we can go to our fault, uh, to, to, if there were false, we would include those. But in this case, we go to the networks of unconformities. And in this case, we have to make the pin three as our master surface, our token unconformity as our master surface, and we're making the pin seven, the uh, Pennsylvania Mississippian unconformity secondary to that master erosion surface. So we're gonna hit okay, and we're gonna turn that puppy on. We're gonna update the model. And now we have a, a series of services that are geologically realistic, appropriately projected, and structurally pretty close to being accurate, which now gives us the opportunity to start worrying about what do we have actually in our map systems. So here's that Mississippian map that we have. Um, we're gonna turn off the Mississippian map, and we're gonna start talking about the rocks that matter to us for the purposes of our exploration activity. And in particular, I'm interested in the area between the top of my big fat sand zone that we talked about earlier, and the bottom of that uh, big fat sand zone, which is the base of my Pennsylvania sitting in here. The gap in between is the taper that exists between those rocks. Now I can turn on the structure uh, of, the, of, of the surface that sits at the bottom here, the pin seven. And so now I can see there's a localized hole sitting in here. And I can and I can see that I've preserved even some of the overlying sediment within that hole. I can see a pin, my pinch, my primary pinch out edge of all of the system. I also have the beginning of the truncation running across here. So now we've got a three-dimensional picture going on. If I go into my pin seven, uh, or I'm, I'm gonna say, let's have a look at pin six. And I'm going to see what I can do about turning on a fill. So this gives me a feeling for once I've created a fill here which, and show the fill, I can turn it on. And this, I have to turn it on first. There we go. Uh, this ends up showing me uh, my, my aerially extensive uh, succession of the 
of the of this lower um, Pennsylvanian sand, its edge where it starts to be truncated and the edge where it stops being truncated. Well, obviously, if, if I've got a big blob sitting out here, one of the immediate questions I have is, gee, is there an opportunity for stratigraphic trapping? I know that in general, up dip is off to my uh, present day up dip is off to the off to the lower right to the toward the east and southeast. So if I have a look at this, just let's go ahead and do an arbitrary line. So we can go ahead now that I've got my thousand wells that I've picked through here. Each of these is an individual well point control. I can do one of two things. I can either define well to well. like so, or I can jump out across a broad area and do this. So now I've got a combination of well control and, um, I've got a combination of well control and of, of my, my projected succession. And I've got a template here that I've created that, that I like pretty well. I've got two different ones, but I've got a template here that I've created that spaces things out about right. And we can talk about that in a moment. And so immediately what I can see is that my zone of interest, here's my through going unconformity, and I've got a zone of interest sitting in here, delineated by the green, it's pinched out. The green is pinched out over here for these two wells. The green comes into the section right there where we show its edge. It comes along too thin to be of any interest for me, and then it thickens out considerably into this thick accommodation sitting in here, probably somewhat fault control. Then we see that thick unit come up dip and pinch out against the unconformity again, and we never see it again going further up the structure. Wow, that could be a strat trap. Well, what about the other direction? Let's talk about, I'm gonna just close that, that cross section out. And I'm gonna create another section. This time, let's run the opposite direction. And I'll go back to my template again, turn that on, and there again is my opportunity. I actually have a full thickness of this interval sitting in here, so all of my pin six interval is present. It goes up dip to the north, just as it went up dip to the east and pinches out. So I've got a good lead now at this point for a, a nice little strat trap um, sitting in, sitting sitting right in here somewhere in this general area. So this, is, this is, so this is an exciting thing from a standpoint of opportunities. There's no wells that have been drilled in here. I've got an honest to goodness opportunity for an exploration target. So John, is there anything else you'd like to talk about right now while we're here worried about this edge before we go and look at the 3D? I just wanna, <clears throat> excuse me, Lee. I just wanna point out briefly how Lee, um, rendered these edges, these pinch outs, if you will, on the map. If you go into, let's say, the through going pen three unconformity here and open up the little plus sign, you'll notice we have this unconformity or correlation, correlation and unconformity intersections option. And this is where you can turn on these edges right here, okay? And I think Lee turned on the pen six edge here and probably turned on an edge here between pen three. So pen three and pen seven edges here and the pen six pen, I'm sorry, the pen three, pen six edges there. So that's how those things are rendered, you see. Just wanted to point that out real briefly. So oh, you turn it off, the edge goes away. And again, with this much control uh, and Lee doing all this correlation work, you have a pretty accurate estimate of the pinch out of those units in this area. It's a very, very powerful tool. Okay, Lee, and did you say you wanted to play around in the 3D a little bit? Move into 3D, John. So Gverse Geo Modeling has a 3D viewer now, and, um, you turn Lee, off those and Lee, you've been having great fun with the 3D viewer, admit it, right? I have had a great fun, especially, I love it when a prospect comes together. We've already got a pretty good idea that I want to be drilling right about in here based on what we've seen. You know, we have a thick that sits in here. We know that we have up dip going this way and up dip going that way, but the thickest best rock and the most, most up dip area of the thickest best rock is somewhere right in here. 
in three dimensions, we can see the through going surface running up. There's, there's maybe an opportunity for a little bit of structural game here. We know that there are structural highs in here that are productive, and it looks like just off of the plane here, we're probably coming up to another structural apex sitting in here. But my target is in this little outlier in our unconformity. And so if I take the, one of the nice aspects of this tool is I have the opportunity to just as if I were using seismic section, I have the ability to cut downward and down into and through my layers. And there I can see just here, the beginning edge of the stratigraphic pinch out. I can continue cutting downward through there. And there's my big fat thick in its up dip position sitting right in there. So that's pretty exciting to look at. And now I can cut it this way. If I start cutting across this way, I can see my, my nice uniform unit six. You can see the down dip pinch out of unit six sitting over here, cruises up, runs up over the structure and gets really thick sitting back here where it's not been partially truncated. This reddish surface is the surface of the unconformity. And let's go ahead and turn the pin three on. That's our master surface. There's the pin three. And so now as I move laterally, uh, as I move along through here, we can see the pin three chopping out and virtually completely chopping out our zone of interest in here, the pin six. As we continue across, we see that that outlier is present. And we have not only the basal lower quality rock, but the higher quality pin six rock sitting in here. As we move across, you can see that we lose that lower succession we gradually get thinner and thinner and thinner and we've pinched out. So there is our target. And we want to drill probably right about there. And that is pretty exciting from my perspective because I like finding oil and gas. And these, these areas tend to be, when you find them, tend to produce extremely well. Drilling depths are only a few thousand feet deep. Production is usually up to or in excess of 100 barrels per day. I like it when that happens. <laughs> all right john any other comments no lee fantastic job thanks a lot and um yeah i think christina let you know how you can ask questions of lee or i and we will address those questions um and with that uh, appreciate your attendance and uh, christina will have some parting words for you um but uh again the power of GVerse geo modeling in a real world example, I think, can't be underestimated. So, again, appreciate your attendance and appreciate your attention. Thanks, everybody. Thanks,